Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of OA On Air, the official podcast of O'Neill & Associates. I'm Kyan Isaacson, and on behalf of the entire OA team, thanks for tuning in. We're excited about this new podcast and look forward to bringing you news, analysis, and interviews from thought leaders and experts each week. Kicking things off, Cosmo Macero brings us 3 to one go where we'll talk about the mass pension system leading the nation, Uber's panic button, and cannabis in the Commonwealth. Suzanne Morris and Shakira Gregory will talk with Alex Montgomery, who just wrote a piece about the intersection of LGBTQIA and Greek life on college campuses for this year's Boston Pride Guide. And wrapping things up, we'll have two minutes with Tom, where our CEO and founder of O'Neill & Associates, Tom O'Neill, will talk about freedom of speech and what that means in the digital age. First up, three, two, one, go. Hello and welcome to the inaugural edition of 321GO on OA On Air, the official podcast series of O'Neill & Associates, New England's leader in public affairs. My name is Cosmo Macero. I'm the host of 321GO, where each week we'll take a brief but purposeful look at three important stories from the worlds of business, government, investing, and economic development. In this, the first week ever on 321GO, We'll learn how the Massachusetts State Pension Fund is the best in the nation when it comes to generating big returns from private equity. And Uber introduces its long-expected panic button, what that means for Uber riders and drivers alike. And finally, Massachusetts is just days from seeing its first licenses issued for the sale of recreational cannabis in anticipation of retail storefronts opening on July 1st. Joining me here on 321GO is Kyan Isaacson. Hello. Hello, Kyan. Kyan's a senior director with O'Neill & Associates and a state government expert as both a consultant and former state agency senior staff member. Kyan, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Cosmo? Excellent. Excellent. Glad to have you here. In this, Hey, this must be exciting for you because it is for me. It's the inaugural edition of 321GO. We're making things happen. We are. We're making history. Okay. All right, first up, private equity as part of public pension funds. Recently, just the other day, the American Investment Council, which represents the private equity industry, issued its annual report on private equity and pensions. And guess what? Number one, as an asset class, private equity is good news for public employees, for state state police, for teachers, for everyone covered by public pensions. It's good news because it's it's really the number one driver among asset classes for public pensions in America. Over the past 10 years, it has consistently outperformed other classes. Hey, and guess what? Guess who's tops in class? The Massachusetts State Pension Fund. That's right. MassPrem represents or manages over $72 billion in assets for uh, pension holders and state employees in Massachusetts. Their private equity portfolio private equity. Essentially, it's investing capital, not through the public markets, but privately into companies, very often taking control of a company to turn it around and achieve profits long term. Consistently, again, the best performing uh, category of asset for pension funds. The Massachusetts Pension Fund is a consistent leader in private equity nationwide. uh, And you can't get much better than number one, in 2018, Mass Prim was ranked number one by the American Investment Council, which ranked the top 10 private equity portfolios among public funds based on 10-year annualized returns ending June 30th, 2017. Hey, guess what? That's out of 163 public funds. And the Massachusetts private equity portfolio, number one, actually not just for the first time, it's the third time, I think, in the past five or six years that the state fund has really achieved that. So it's uh, it's good news for taxpayers. It's good news for retirees here in Massachusetts. And it shows that Mass Prim, the Pension Reserves Investment Management Board, the professional staff and the board that oversee all of that investment are really at the top of their game. Michael Trotsky, Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer. Mike Bailey, who heads the private equity portfolio. And State Treasurer Deb Goldberg, the chairperson of the Prim Board. A lot of leadership right there. Again, this really demonstrates the superior investment performance that, uh, that this team is giving the Commonwealth uh, uh, and, and is really important recognition. Mm-hmm. 
Next up, Uber. In April, Uber announced they'd be adding a direct way for riders to call 911 within its app during a ride in case there's some kind of a safety issue or an emergency. Well, this week they rolled that out. People are calling it the Uber Panic Button. It's a feature in the app where right now a rider can notify Uber that there is a problem. In the future, I think in the near future, Uber's going to be rolling this out for drivers also. So both the rider and the driver will be armed with essentially the same emergency feature in their app in case things go wrong. Cayenne, what do you think of this feature? I'm still trying to sort through whether just dialing 911, like you've been taught since you were about four years old, is, is, is the best remedy in any emergency situation. Yeah, that's sort of my concern as well. The idea to go into an app and then dial 911 and then you're asked to verify if you actually want to dial 911 and that's not a pocket dial, which I understand could be cumbersome uh, for Uber, but it's even more cumbersome for the person needing to contact emergency officials because something bad is happening to them into a car. So my gut says I'm still just going to call 911 directly unless Uber is giving me a reason why going through their safety center app is a better way to go. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be. You know, I don't. Know, I don't want to get down on human nature, but I feel like there's some there's some potential here for this to become some kind of a tool or weapon that riders and drivers use against each other as some kind of a threat if the ride is not going the right way. I mean, really, it ought to be reserved for God forbid you're in an accident, right? And you're a passenger, and God forbid the driver's injured. You, you need to get help right away because that driver's hurt because you're in an accident. And, and maybe this app makes sense because, okay, you take a few extra seconds to process this. There's an extra step. Maybe you lose a couple seconds and, and that's okay. But if, if there's some kind of negative or dangerous or bad thing happening between two people in this vehicle, and let's be honest, it's happened, right? It, it, it's kind of why they're introducing the feature. Um, I, I don't know. It's, 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 it's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I think it's absolutely a positive development. I don't know if it will be used in the restrained way that Uber probably hopes it will be used. Well, and it's funny you say if they're going to use this against each other, it's almost like the, the rating system amped up. Like, am I going to am I gonna call 911 before you call 911? Um, I think the idea in yeah, general... Yeah, I'm going to push the button on you, buddy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. We're lost? I'm going to push the button on you. I'm pushing the button on you. You know, I think that the idea, the the intentions are clearly good. I think that Uber has certainly unveiled pretty recently. Uh, they've got a new commercial out. Their new leadership is really taking passenger and uh, safety incredibly serious, which they should. Uh, the very idea of Uber when it first started, I was adamantly against. I, I could not wrap myself my head around the idea of getting into a car with a stranger. Um, because we're taught our entire lives that we're not supposed to do that. So the more we can do to make this a safe place, particularly for, you know, I do think it's passengers more often, but drivers obviously are in dangerous positions as well. Um, but it's a multi multiple step process, and that concerns me. I think yeah. I'm more apt to dial 911 than they describe it as riders will need to swipe up on the safety center icon then tap 911 assistance, and then they will be asked to confirm that they meant to dial 911 before the call is put through to emergency dispatch. So, I don't know, that's 15 to 20 seconds between my dialing 911 and getting to somebody. If I'm being attacked by my driver, I don't know that I want to wait an additional 15 seconds or that my driver is going to let me. Hold, please, I have to swipe up and verify that I mean to call 911. Exactly, yeah, I mean, look, we could probably find all kinds of flaws. The reality is it's a safety enhancement that probably makes a lot of sense. I'm just curious as to how it works. And by the way, look, I, I generally enjoy the Uber experience. I think it's kind of interesting that as it has, as it has evolved um, to the better of the company and probably to the better of access to use, they first rolled this out a few years ago or more than a few. And I remember it's like, wow, you know, you get this sort of limo car service treatment. It's not that expensive. It's pretty awesome. Well, there's such demand for rides that, I mean, it feels like just about anyone with any kind of car can get can sign up for some level of Uber and be a driver. Yeah, that limo experience. <laughs> I've, I've gotten into a couple of Ubers that do not fit that bill. No, a couple and of And it's not. not just Uber, any ride-sharing service. That's right. Nothing against That's Uber. That's right. Um, 
you know, Uber and Lyft and ride sharing has absolutely hurt the, the traditional cab business. And when, and when it comes to things like safety, look, everyone's encountered that guy, that cab driver, or maybe maybe more than once, right? Just, But you know what? You can't get away from the fact that it's an industry and it's professionals that are regulated by the police department that have very visible identification and very visible um, uh, licensing and all these things that are regulated. And, and I think the ride-sharing services need to overcome that um, that gap in the experience to make people feel like, you know what, you, you can feel comfortable riding with us. And I think, I think that's an important part of this, you know. I think it's a good step in the right direction just to show that they, they're caring and they're trying to find a way through it. Um, another part of the story I found really interesting was the 911 integration pilot that's rolling out in a few markets, um, not in Boston yet. Um, but they noted that a recent USA story said that 911's chances of getting a bead on a distress call's location can be as low as 10%. Um, I think if if my Uber app is going to get me a better response from from 911 because they know my location, then maybe that's the reason you go through it. Because yeah. Uber can find me anywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> they definitely can. I watch them track me as I move on the sidewalk. Absolutely. Um, the... Uh, I'll leave it at this, and, 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 as, and as a PR person myself, I always like a, a comment that really, I think, does its job. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to say his name right, Sakin Consales, the Uber, Uber's Director of Product Management, right? And he, we, again, we're talking about public safety. So he says, we realize that a lot of situations and a lot of criminal activity arises when people think they're not being watched. We just want to say that we're turning on the lights. And I, I think that that's a really well said, uh, a, a, a well put statement addressing the importance of this and what they're trying to do. And, uh, and I think for a company that has tremendous potential and is really, in a positive way, by and large, impacted, uh, impacted society and the economy and, and, and really given all kinds of people at just about every, maybe not every single, but just about every level of the economic scale, Uber is affordable in some perhaps lesser form than you and I are accustomed to, but it's 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 accessible accessible to just about anybody. Um, they've really done a good job, and this is an important thing uh, that that they're that they're introducing. Hey, it's it, it can't hurt, right? Agreed. Um, and I think as long as they do this in accordance with everything else they're talking about, I think they're going to be in good shape. All right. What do you think about the Uber panic button? I'd like to hear from you. Tweet me at Cosmo Macero. Hashtag OA on air. Thanks. And finally, hey, let's buy some marijuana. The Cannabis Control Commission here in Massachusetts has given the green light for licenses to be issued for retail establishments as soon as, say, the middle of June. Learning this from the State House News Service, which covers this uh, emerging new industry very closely from the regulatory perspective. So we all know July 1st, or you ought, to, you ought to know, July 1st, retail sale for recreational marijuana becomes legal in Massachusetts. Is a, well, it already is, but it goes forward July 1st. We'll probably see just a handful, I'm going to guess about 24, and here's why, just a handful of retail establishments open on that day, probably the 24 or so medical dispensaries that already exist in Massachusetts, they're going to flip the switch and begin to introduce the retail sale of recreational marijuana to anyone over the age of 21. Um, and uh, that's, that's the first way that people are going to experience this in terms of being able to buy marijuana for recreational purposes, not having to be a licensed registered patient, cannabis patient in Massachusetts. And that starts July 1st. So these licenses being issued now are for retail, are for, are for retail recreational, are for grow licenses for recreational. A number of different categories of businesses that are going to be in this industry. Um, there's about 800 or so people queued up or entities, entities queued up already. There's another 85 or so that are filing information with the Cannabis Control Commission, even though they don't have a complete program ready or a complete business plan ready. They're beginning to file information, but 
a lot of activity. In fact, we worked with earlier this year the New England Cannabis Conventions here in Boston, the number one business to business convention in the cannabis industry. It was unbelievable the interest and the attendance and the business to business conversations that were happening, the hundreds over a hundred programmers, uh, over a hundred programs of experts in the industry, um, all here in Boston for this, uh, for, for the birth of an industry here uh, in Massachusetts. So July 1st is a, is a key milestone. Those licenses right now uh, are in the process of being issued. Cayenne, how do you think this shakes out? We know a few things. We know that certain municipalities in Massachusetts, really more than half of them, have either taken steps to prohibit or limit or delay as long as possible the introduction of retail establishments for recreational cannabis in their communities. Um, is it going to be focused in large urban areas? Is it, are, are they going to pop up in all kinds of communities? Is Are, are the are the establishments and retail businesses that are related <clears throat> going to grow out of this? Excuse the pun. I mean, what, what, what do you think? <laughs> Good pun. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be really interesting. I mean, I live in a small town, smallish town south of the city, uh, Canton, and we just prohibited having a, a retail marijuana shop in our town. However, the town next to us, Sharon, which is a dry town, so you cannot serve alcohol anywhere in Sharon at restaurants or establishments, approved it. Um, so I really think the difference from town to town and city to city is going to be really interesting to watch. Uh, I think we are impressively known for our nimbyism here in Massachusetts, particularly in the greater Boston area, um, and how that's going to pan out. But I think it's an exciting time. I mean, I think it's going to be equally interesting to watch how the commission manages this. I mean, such an onslaught in such a small period of time. We all know that bureaucracy has a tendency to get slow. 90 days can quickly turn into a lot longer. Um, so we'll have to stay tuned. Yeah. You know, I think the regular, I think the law, as it was approved by voters, I think the regulations that have been created, I think that the commission and its work so far, uh, really pretty darn good examples for how something comes together and how it's being managed. I think there are some quibbles that could be reasonable that we're delaying. You know, we want everything at once. We want to have cafes and delivery. You know, hey, this is all people got to slow down. It's all starting from scratch, and you got to, and, and, and and this is forever, right? This is forever, and you know, I think that the industry does not want to be ghettoized, does not want to be um, zoned and permitted into certain corners of a community or a city. It's 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 designed to be experienced as, as, as sort of part of the landscape of a community that uh, that wants to have uh, retail cannabis being sold. And, and, and by the way, um, it already is for X number of patients in Massachusetts who um, have been treated for several years now, three going on I think three and a half years, by registering and becoming a licensed patient in Massachusetts. So it's already sort of part of the culture that way. Um, there's a big movement about you should legalize cannabis, but don't normalize it. And, and, I, and there's an argument you could be made for that. I'm not sure I'd make that argument, but there's an argument to be made for that, that, hey, okay, fine. But do we all of a sudden have to absorb this as, as, as a big part of our culture? Um, and, and that's what some people argue. Yeah, I, I grew up um, in a DEA household with two Drug Enforcement Administration parents. So uh, my position on that might be a little bit different than others. But, um, you know, I think, I think we want people to feel comfortable, people who have been, you know, feeling like they need to hide and, and do it in their, their living room. And it, people that don't want to be purchasing it illegally and want to be able to just get up and go down the street and walk out of the store, um, you know, People should be able to do what, what they need to do. Medical marijuana has been a great first step um, to normalizing it to a certain extent. And I don't know if I don't I don't know if we have a say in whether or not it gets normalized. I think society has will make that determination. And I think we're getting there pretty quickly, um, partially generational, but that's not up to the policymakers as to whether or not we normalize the use of marijuana. Uh, that's going to happen with or without you know our elected officials. Yeah. yeah. That's really well said. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the, in the marketplace solves the problems. And in this case, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in seeing how the product development and the solutions that are created to problems because, and, 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 and certainly, the, uh, there's all kinds of products in the cannabis field and edibles and 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 and, lotion and uh, oils and concentrates and ways to, to 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 consume it or ways to use it that that don't impact your your surroundings because I think the reality is as a society we're just about there that you know combustible smoke smoke and smoking is an unpleasant experience for everyone and I think that's one of the solutions that the marketplace is, is, is already starting to solve and probably will continue to do so because that'll always be the case and and, and there's already ways for users of cannabis to uh, uh, use different types of products to, to, to solve that problem um, but there's all kinds of other issues that I think it's going to be fascinating watching as this industry grows how the how the marketplace addresses things and solves the problems yeah, and I think, you know, back to the normalization, and it's going to be interesting when we're sitting here and having this conversation with, you know, my son, your kids, 20 years from now, and uh, they're going to look back and say, I can't believe there was a time that marijuana was ever not legal. It's just, I think that's the future, and that's the path we're on. Massachusetts is, I think, doing a really great job in making sure that they get this done right the first time. Um, I think that that has been to the deterrent of people of speed for some people, but to the point you made earlier, we've got to do this forever. Um, and the, the commission's done a great job and maybe a little bit slower than people would like, but we're going to be up and running pretty soon. Yeah, I think, that, well said. I, th I think that, I think they've applied just, just the right measure of restraint and, 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 it's, and it's been effective. Um, and it's going to make sure that at every step it'll be best practices and, and, and there's not going to be mistakes made or hopefully none. And I think that that's a good thing. I think we like to consider ourselves leaders here in Massachusetts on a lot of issues. Um, and I think this is probably going to be another one. All right. Hey, Kyan, thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Cosmo. So this one's in the books. That's going to do it for this, the first segment ever of 3 to one go 3 to one go was recorded in the OA On Air Studios just off the historic Tip O'Neill Room at our building in the heart of Government Center, Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, thanks for listening, and goodbye till next time. I'm Cosmo Macero. Now, Suzanne Morris and Shakira Gregory talk with Alex Montgomery. Boston Pride Week kicks off June 1st with the annual flag raising ceremony at City Hall in Boston at 12 o'clock. It's a great event and if you're in the area we would encourage you to stop by and check it out. Welcome to OA on the Air. This is Suzanne Morris, Vice President at O'Neill & Associates, and I am here with my colleague, Shakir Gregory. Say hello, Hello, Shakir. everyone. Shakir Gregory, Director of Digital and Social Engagement. Great. And I'm also here today with Alex Montgomery to discuss this year's Boston Pride Guide, which was just released and is now available online and at select locations. Alex wrote a featured article on being both a member of the LGBTQIA community and a member of a Greek-like organization, otherwise known as a fraternity or sorority. Alex came to the Boston area to attend a master's program at Brandeis University and has been working there as well, but will soon be returning to the Midwest. The Boston Pride Guide can be found at www.bostonpride.org backslash guide. Welcome, Alex. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so... Tell us a little bit about how it happened that you actually ended up writing this article for the Pride Guide. Yeah, sure. So uh, I was hanging out at Prudential, uh, the Prudential Center last year, um, waiting for my partner to finish up with some friends. And I was checking Facebook and my bra, my fraternity bra, which I may get into a little bit later, um, Angela Haynes, also known as Encore, um, who's been very involved with Boston Pride for years now, uh, was talking about a Pride Guide release party where, where she was. And so I inboxed her and I said, hey, bro, I'm in the area. You know, do you want to get together after? And she said, why don't you just come by? And so um, I ended up going to last year's Pride Guide release party where uh, I then met Michael, the editor-in-chief of last year's uh, Pride Guide issue. 
And uh, we started talking about a little bit about what I did and how I knew Encore. And um, that turned into a conversation about possibly pinning a piece about my experiences as um, a member of an LGBTQIA centered uh, Greek letter organization. And so uh, we picked the process back up this year with Jesse and Kevin and Michael, and here we are. So I'm really happy to see that uh, it's come to fruition. So tell us a little bit more about your own experience, both as a member of the LGBTQI community and a member of a Greek organization. I feel like that's a fascinating intersection. Yes, for sure. So I came out um, uh, as a member of the LGBTQIA community during my undergraduate years in the late aughts, so around like 2008, 2009. Um, and I was seeking community, you know, uh, I ended up stumbling upon our gay straight alliance at my alma mater and I went to the first meeting as a freshman and there I felt like I was tapping into myself, a side of myself that I had never tapped into before. So, um, I remained pretty heavily involved for all four years, um, of my time there. And then my sophomore year is when I started really exploring my gender identity. So I am assigned female at birth, but I identify more non-binary, trans mask. And so I really started getting into my masculine expression and masculine energies at that time. Uh, I also was then dating someone who was a member of a historically black Greek sorority. And I was experiencing some of that uh, some of her, I, I had I, I was able to I guess uh, vicariously experience some of the things that she was going through as um, a member as a queer member or LGBTQIA um, a member of of a traditionally black sorority and so uh, her experiences um, got me thinking about okay I kind of would like to have this for myself and I looked at it as a, an opportunity for connection and networking and siblinghood but. Uh, the more I started researching some of the traditional Greek letter organizations that have been around for hundreds of years at this point, um, the more I realized that I was going to then have to compromise certain aspects of the person I was becoming. Mm -hmm. And so um, before I gave up hope, I did a random Google search uh, for LGBTQIA Greek life, and lo and behold, there are people out here already doing the work. So I decided to spend a year doing research, and I decided to join my organization my junior year. That's great. So the article, you talk a lot about the misconceptions that um, people have of Greek-like organization, and obviously there's a lot of misconceptions around members of the LGBTQIA uh, community. So can you talk a little bit about both the differences and the similarities about those misconceptions? Sure, sure. So uh, one one similarity that I find between both groups is this this notion of deviance, right? Um, I think that when it comes to the LGBTQIA community, uh, for some folks, it's still looked at very stigmatized and, you know, folks are, are wavering within their identity and how they choose to identify. It's a choice, right? Um, you know, people can't be who they are, right? Just outright. There's always some type of question about it. And it happens even within the LGBTQIA community, right? Like I'm thinking about ace folks and bi folks and, and trans folks and how you know, um, how trans are you? How much of something are you, right? So it happens not just to the LGBTQIA community, but happens even within the LGBTQIA community. And so I think about that and I think about the parallel of Greek life, Greek letter organizations and how uh, many times the outward depiction is of hazing and of, you know, illicit activity and, and bullying and um, you know, wild party behavior. Think about the stereotypical frat boy and how that's become a part of a uh, popular lexicon, right? To describe a particular behavior, or to describe a person who displays a particular outrageous erratic behavior, right? Uh, mean girls, which are usually reserved for members of sororities, right? Um, or perceived members of, of, of sororities, right? So um, I think that... Uh, what my intent was with this article was to highlight the beauty within the LGBTQIA community, the importance of us finding community, and also how Greek life doesn't have to be this wild, outrageous um, 
a entity that's reserved for the rich or for people who perform a particular type of femininity or masculinity that it can coexist. And while I didn't want to highlight it as some type of utopia, it is, um, you know, a, a burgeoning ground where folks are pioneering a particular Greek letter experience um, for folks who may have craved that but didn't want to or were unable to um, uh, join while they were in school or um, if they chose not to go to school, there may still be an opportunity to join a Greek letter organization. So there's just a lot of ways in which that it shows the Greek life is beautiful and diverse, just like our LGBTQIA you know, community is diverse as well. Thank you, Alex. We appreciate you spending the time with us today. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, Shakira, and Alex. Next up, we have two minutes with Tom, where our CEO, Tom O'Neill, is going to talk a little bit about freedom of speech in the digital age. Tom, you recently spoke at the Mass Access Annual Conference about freedom of speech. And for those who don't know, Mass Access is the nonprofit trade organization represented in community media centers throughout the Commonwealth, also known as your local cable stations. Currently, these stations are fighting to ensure their vitality, and Mass Access is working on changes to legislation that will put them on equal footing with other cable offerings. Now, focusing on freedom of speech in the digital age, just this week we saw an example of our First Amendment at work and the consequences when Roseanne Barr shamefully tweeted and ABC rose to respond. What are your thoughts? Freedom of speech uh, in the case of Roseanne Barr it doesn't make her speech honest speech, but it makes it it makes it it makes a pure speech um, because she was obviously saying things she she believes in. She calls it a bad joke. I, I don't see that it was a joke at all or an attempt to be a joke. I, I saw it as something insulting and hateful. Uh, and I saw it as racist. Um, when I when I talk about protection of free speech, most often free speech within our cable networks for local programming when when we're talking about newspapers like the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, you know that you're getting free, uh, legitimately honest reportage and, and speech. Um, what we're not talking about is free speech in, in the way that the President of the United States has allowed you know, all safeguards to be let down so the people are made to feel that they can say and do almost anything they feel uh, and, and talk about almost anything they feel like talking about, even when it's hateful and racist and wrong. Um, so when I, talk about, when I talk about free speech, the twist I give it is, you know, if you, want to, if you want to successfully turn around what has been going wrong in media, in mediums, you know, then what you want to do is, is press for truth in that speech and read the things that are most truthful when you read a newspaper. Listen to honest radio. Um, it's not distorted. Listen to programming on television and uh, local, local cable uh, programming when you, know, when you know that you're going to get an honest, truthful approach. And that's the speech that we want to protect. So what do you think about the idea that Let's, I mean, we can use Roseanne as an example, but really anybody who is spouting hateful speech or um, whether it's true or not, they're doing it under the veil of freedom of speech. speech. Yeah. But so is ABC when it takes them exactly five seconds to turn around and cancel her television program because they won't be associated with that kind of, that kind of feeling of, uh, or speechifying, if you will, and, uh, and hateful remarks that are being given by somebody there in, in their employment. And I congratulate them. So I congratulate their first speech. That's it for our first ever edition of OA On Air. Thanks for listening. A special welcome to all of our OA interns who are here for the summer. And for all of you, be sure to subscribe on iTunes and SoundCloud and send us your thoughts, questions, and comments using the hashtag OA On Air.
OA On Air is developed, recorded, and produced in our Boston office here in Government Center. Production by Brooke O'Meara Sion. And content creation by the O'Neill & Associates team. Music is provided by Ben Sound and Long Zijun. To stay up to date with us here at OA On Air, be sure to subscribe on SoundCloud and iTunes.